I'd now like to invite all of our speakers to the stage, and we're going to have, uh, we have about 15 minutes or so for discussion, and I invite members of the audience to uh, go to the microphones if you have questions. Terrific. So, so um, um, I think this was a fascinating, fascinating session, session and, and very appropriate for concluding this conference because I think you, uh, all four of you summarized a number of the aspects of public engagement that we're so hoping we can catalyze by these, holding these sorts of meetings that include both scientists and people that are really practicing the work of science and technology and those that are thinking deeply about their impacts and how we communicate our results to the public, and I hope we can uh, have our communities much more closely connected than they have sometimes uh, been in the past. So I thought I would, I'd like to just ask one question to kick things off, and I think we have, yes, we have a few uh, people lining up, which is great, but I wanted to ask, uh, pose a question to Anna, because I think you, um, uh, you made an uh, interesting point that, that struck me during your presentation about uh, how people perceive data uh, differently and certainly in different parts of the world and also how they perceive their uh, data being utilized because um, one of the things that's under very active discussion as you know right now is the use of data that are put onto uh, social networks such as Facebook and how those data then become uh, you know distributed and, and utilized certainly for um, commercial efforts, and, uh, and, yet and yet people do this anyway, they do it freely, they're not forced to put their, their personal information on these sites, and they do it presumably because they feel they are getting a benefit from it, and yet um, you pointed out that in many cases people feel that having their uh, genomic data shared with commercial operations would be, uh, you know, viewed as, as suspect and, and uh, not seen as in any way beneficial to them. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, it, it, was, it was really interesting in that some people could make very sophisticated differences between different types of data and what's most important to them. Uh, so, for example, people could very clearly say banking details. If, if, if my bank was hacked, then I could personally lose money, um, but yet not able to articulate if my genomic data was hacked, what harm could actually come from that. And then people started to imagine, well, could you clone me if my genomic data is hacked? Could you plant me at the scene of a crime? Um, and then all these sort of sci-fi kind of influences from popular culture start to come out about, well, what actually could happen if my data was hacked. Um, so I have no answers to that other than people um, have no clear kind of um, opinions either way, but some were able to kind of play with the idea of well, where would it go, what would it lead to without a real strong sense of, of the reality really of the actual harms. So I guess the challenge that we have going forward is how to, how to figure out ways to communicate to people to explain to them, you know, what the consequences are, what, what's real, what's hype, what's, uh, you know, what's true versus not true. What, yes, what is the actual real risk if you were identified? Um, and would you even really genuinely care given that you identify yourself in other ways? Right, right. Great, so I'd like to uh, open up now the, uh, to the questions, and we have uh, quite a few people lined up, so we don't have a lot of time. I think what I'll do, as, as we've had some of the other sessions do, is I'm gonna take, uh, I'll, we'll go side by side, and I'll take two questions at a time, and then we'll ask the speakers to respond um, relatively briefly so that we can get through the rest of the questions or as many as possible. Let's start over here. Hi, hello, I'm Sarah Brooks-Dresser from Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, and I want to ask about, I'd say, the difference between trust and trustworthiness. Um, so with trust, the assumption is that the public doesn't understand and that with education and explanation, they will. Um, the concept of trustworthiness is more that the onus is on the institutions, that they actually have to have practices that are consistent with what the public finds is fair, for example. Um, so I don't mean projecting an image of trust, trustworthiness, but actual practices. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, really any of the panelists, 
what they think governments or private companies or health systems can do to make themselves more trustworthy. Um, that's it, thanks. Thank you, and uh, from the other side? Dana Carroll, University of Utah. I'm impressed with the success that of these uh, well-designed, well-run uh, local events that uh, several of the panelists described. And I'm wondering if you have any sense what, what sort of ripple effect there has been. Uh, are the people who've been engaged in these uh, small events going out into their communities and uh, giving us additional benefit uh, from the discussions that have been had locally? Thank you. Thank you. So, so uh, two, two questions about, about trust, trust versus trustworthiness, trustworthiness and, and I would, I would say, say the dissemination, dissemination of uh, local discussions to a broader, broader community. community. Anybody, Anybody want to comment, comment on those, uh, uh, address those questions? Um, I'll make I'll a start, because then it's easier. easier. Um, just, just a very short answer. answer. I, I think, think transparency that you see is perhaps the most important thing for trustworthiness. And for the ripple effect, at least with, with my, my study, study, I feel there, there is definitely, definitely a ripple effect, effect because um, for, for those, those participants, participants that's, that's in the, the workshop, workshop, it really it gives them the confidence that actually we don't have to censor any kind of uh, uh, opinion before um, the, running the running of such, such workshop, workshop, and it can still be a very constructive and positive um, outcome waiting for us. So, and I think a couple of them have returned to their institutions and plan um, subsequent events, so definitely. So I was just going to add and to say around the ripple effect that I think it also depends on who invites you in, who organises the event. I think that then affects dissemination. So us holding something, inviting people, publics in, is probably not as effective as being invited in. But sometimes they, they can be tough decisions, tough conversations. We've got some empirical data on what people perceive um, trust to look like. Um, and, and it's, it's shown that transparency, transparency is the absolute key. key. So if you're, if you're really, really honest about who's, who's going to benefit from your data, data, if they're going, they're going to, make to make money, money or not, what, what the, the potential risks are, people, people are much, much more trusting, trusting of, of, of that information. information. And actually, it doesn't it seem to affect their willingness to donate their data. They actually prepared to weigh up the risks. They're able to articulate the potential harms and still donate their data. Interesting. Uh, over, over here, here please. please. Uh, hello. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Tiak uh, Fayal, Nature Genetics. Um, um, one, one question that is always in the back of my mind, mind uh, and this derives both from my personal experience uh, engaging, engaging with the general with the public, public in science fairs, fairs or festivals, festivals and, also and also reading surveys, is, is that I've often found that sometimes people have quite strong opinions about certain scientific subjects, but then when probed further or when I inquire specifically about certain concepts, I realize that sometimes they don't really grasp them properly. And uh, in many surveys, for example, that I read about stem cell research or CRISPR or, or genetics in general, uh, I'm alarmed by some of the responses or, or, or not. But, but then if I look further on, there are questions that I think to me indicate that the participants probably did not uh, fully uh, grasp, grasp some key, key concepts. So, so I'm wondering, wondering in your surveys, surveys and in your workshops, do you, do you also take, take that into account? account? Do you, do you ask, ask people before or after the survey or before or after the workshop? Do, do you, you actually test, test their, their knowledge? knowledge? Um, that's, 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 that's one, one general, general comment, comment and question. Because uh, I mean, I just, just as a, to, to give an example, example I, I was reading recently a survey on genetics and. Uh, and, and on GMOs, GMOs actually, actually, for example, in, in, in the US. US. And, and some, some of the questions, the questions they were asking people were, would, would you, you be willing, be willing to, to eat food with, with DNA? DNA? <laughs> <laughs> and do you do think, think that, that uh, food with, with DNA, DNA should be, I mean, by law, should be mandatory that it's, it's labeled as such? And would you guess what the response is? I mean, the, the vast majority of people, I think around 70 to 80 percent said yes. That they, <laughs> they think it, it should be required by a law uh, saying that food contains DNA, and a lot of people would not be willing to eat food with DNA. So, on the one hand, you know, do you understand what DNA is? Do you, so, could you please comment on this? Thank you, and we'll take a question over here, and then we'll go to the panel. Yes, Hi, Carol Sapaniak, a Coalition for Ethical Research out of Nebraska, United States. Um, thank, um, thank you so, so much, much for this presentation. presentation. This, this is really, really what I was here for. In regards, in regards to public, public engagement, engagement on day one, we talked about, about, of course, needing societal, societal consensus, consensus 
because we've had past mistakes where we haven't planted those seeds ahead of the technology. Um, virtually all international statements on hum human genome editing have included that public engagement requirements to proceed and sort of tying off um, what this gentleman just mentioned, in order for us to be serious about allowing meaningful input and gaining broad, gaining broad societal consensus um, into what is appropriate for the future of the human genome, we must educate. We have heard some very effective practical ways that can educate the public, but just as on day one, there was talk of having a transitional pathway um, shouldn't, shouldn't we, we take, take the, the next, next step, step now, now from this and, and collaborate to have a global plan to educate the public? The public. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the next, next question is, who might be best equipped to be, equipped responsible, to be responsible to build, build that plan and accomplish that, that task? task. Any, any, any thoughts on how to accomplish this? this? Thank, you. Thank you. To our panel. Um, can, can I say, I say something, something about, about the pseudo-knowledge about, about genetics, genetics that you raise? Um, um, we, we all have pseudo-knowledge. Pseudo I mean, all, all of us supposedly experts in this room may know an awful lot about our own actual area, area but, but when you press us on some of the science, perhaps, we, you know, we, we glaze over a little. We don't have to have in-depth knowledge about absolutely everything in order to be able to offer an opinion or to be able to participate and have dialogue. So I, I feel very much that we should respect broader publics um, from the position that they come from and build um, on what knowledge and understanding that they already have. And I think that's, that's completely appropriate. And I found certainly in focus group work I've done with members of the public about genetics that you can have very sophisticated conversations about genetics without using any of the technical terms because people can talk about family and things in family. So I'm not too worried about the pseudo knowledge and having absolute in-depth knowledge about everything in order to be able to contribute. Um, and then in order to, to build the pathway, yes, I feel we absolutely need a bridge um, to the public. And that's something that should not happen by osmosis. It needs a very formulated, almost a PR campaign that needs to be adequately resourced at a very high level. And that's an expensive thing to do, but I think it's worth doing because this is relevant to all of us. Yeah, um, I want to first comment on the first part of your question because um, I totally, I totally get, get what, you're what you're mean, because uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, this is how, why, why we designed the workshop um, as, as we did, that is, we, we asked people to steer, uh, stick to the empirical, because it's also my feeling that uh, both, both, actually, actually, both, both the public, public and the scientists, scientists sometimes they have an opinion, but that they actually don't really know what it means. So in our workshop, we have um, uh, examples such as, you know, uh, a public who will come up saying, you know, I'm just so against GM technology. And then you would yeah, invite, invite him to say, you know, know why? why? And then he just, just goes go on these monologue, and, and, you know, at, at the end of five, five minutes, minutes, he would correct himself. He says, well, well, you know, well, actually, I, 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 I'm, I'm not, not really against, against technology, technology per se, per se but, but it's because of this and that. So, and I think it's partly related to what you're asking. I think public engagement is not just about a form of public deliberation and all that. But, but it's, it's also, also uh, a necessary, necessary room for, for people, people to digest, digest the information. information. We, we often talk about education, about education but, but, but you know, we, we, we cannot take the digestion of this information, information uh, for granted. granted. They don't, don't always happen automatically, and sometimes, and sometimes if there's, there's no, no room, room to reflect, reflect it, may it may lead to some hiccups. Thank you. So unfortunately, we have to, we will have to conclude this question and answer uh, discussion in about five minutes. So I think what we'll do is take two more questions. Apologies to the rest of the people. I'm very delighted that there's so much interest. But let's take two more questions. And um, let's start over here. Yep, my name is Martin Williams. I've been working on the communications here, so I'm not really a member of the conference. I've got an academic background, also interest in communications. So I've kept hearing about public engagement all the time. I think it's crucial. And uh, yeah, also, this has been a fascinating uh, event to be at for me personally. I'm interested in this and much more exciting, of course, than we expected. But I think social media, I think that hasn't really been discussed. I've just heard Facebook mentioned right at the end. It's something everybody can, can engage in. And I think, and I've just spoke to a member of the organizing committee saying, I think the organizing committee can come up with a plan towards that. It's not expensive in, in money, it's expensive in time. And you will learn a lot about what people think. You get rid of the trolls, you can, you can delete them or not, or just not have them as friends. But you can directly reach the public. You don't need to be filtered by journalists. You can say, this is it. 
and you, and you can, you can, can put, put the feeds out. I, I think, think that, that could be really important. important. You've, You've got, got phenomenally advanced, advanced technologies, technologies that you're all using, this Cas9 and all, all this, this that's incredible to hear of, like, like an, an Apollo program that, that's, that's unfolding. unfolding. But, you're but you're not, not using, using the most modern, modern technologies, technologies to tell people about it, and I hope people will. Thank you. Yes, yes, on the right. I have a similar question to the, the gentleman <laughs> there, uh, um, uh, Satoshi Kodama from Kyoto University of Japan. Uh, so the quick question is what's the role of media, uh, conventional or social media in the, the public engagement? Uh, what, what help can they do in the, you know, this uh, raising uh, well, public health, uh, health you know, engagement activities? Um, uh, Megan, uh, Masako and Megan, would you, either of you like to take that up? So thanks, thanks for the question. question. I, think I think it's, it's, it's obviously, obviously the elephant room after yesterday, yesterday. Uh, after all that excitement. But I, I, I think it's, uh, it's something that I, I've done a lot of. I've done, I do a lot of work with media in Australia. Um, but, but I'm careful, and I, as, as I think many of us are. And I think there's a, a, a risk that we've become too careful and unavailable. Um, but I also think that there's some media that it, it's not, it doesn't help the, to advance the discourse because it's so polarised. So, so I am, am always, always open, open to speaking to journalists from Australia, but I prefer to work with some I trust. So maybe that's also, uh, we need to build trust with journalists. Um, it is a, a very difficult question, I think. Um, social media, uh, especially Facebook or Twitter, is a, a very powerful, very powerful use. But, but I think the, the Twitter and social media and uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, is divide pros people and cons people. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, against people and uh, standing with people. So if, uh, if uh, what, watching at one group, one group, only, only, only one, one group, group I watch it, um, I, I become to think oh, that, that is the majority's opinion, opinion. but, uh, but, but the, 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 the others', others, others opinion, opinion is existent. And, and so, so the, the important, important thing, thing both, 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 both group, group we have, have to watch. watch. But this, this is, is a, a very, very difficult, difficult uh, to do. For, 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 for general, general public, public and general, general public people. people. Anybody, Anybody else? else? Um, yes, I, I, I would definitely endorse working with the media in many, many different forms, but not just the media, also theatre with art. Um, and actually it's been fascinating for me working with uh, members from the advertising industry. I had no idea, but they will um, sometimes buy a line in a script of a very popular soap opera um, as a way of getting very simple messages out. And there are social strategists out there who are paid to work out how to seed ideas into the public consciousness. And I think there's quite a lot that we could do to learn from them. Fascinating. Well, well, I'd like, like to, to uh, thank, thank the, the panel. panel. I think this has been a very interesting, interesting discussion. discussion. So we'll, uh,